the, pr the previous speakers have, have lined up so nicely um, with emphasizing in the, in the long run the importance of standardization, and I hope you're going you're gonna to take that away as a theme for what it takes to turn this into something that happens in the real world, not just in the laboratory. Um, I'm fortunate that I get to work with a very large group of people in our clinic, so I am clinical, um, and we do this research in addition. Um, all of us in this team are as we, as we construct these systems. Radiation oncology, you're pro you, you may not be familiar with, so when, when uh, patients get cancer, part of their treatment very frequently is radiation therapy. And so our objective there is to deliver the radiation so that it's concentrating where the, um, where the tumor is, so here where the red is, um, and trying to avoid collateral damage to other healthy structures. So it's a balance between can we take care of the tumor and not make the, the treatment worse than the disease for the toxicity. So there's that balance. You can see from this image that where that dose goes is a continuum. So there's not a hard line. It's being spread out, and it gets distributed among the organs. So radiation oncology has a very long history of trying to standardize and model these behaviors so that we can understand how to improve um, care for patients. Every treatment is driven by a database and computer technologies. So it's one of the most technology-driven specialties in medicine. As we have, you know, we've approached this from the recognition that we should be able to learn from every patient how to improve care for the next patient. And one of the reasons we want to do that is to then be able to add automation to improve our quality, our consistency, and our efficiency for that treatment. This is what we do locally, but we have you know, a vision of what this needs to, hap what needs to happen on a grander scale. So we work within our own institution, but our population is not representative of populations in other areas of the state, of the country, nation, world. In the long run, we really need to come to a place where it's possible to integrate data from multiple institutions that experience um, as physicians are trying to improve care and then t feed that into analytics, driven statistically and through um, artificial intelligence, to generate insights on how to improve the care. So every day as we approach this, we're asking, what's the next thing we can tweak a little bit to make it better? In the long run, we see this emerging as analytics like lab values. So you've got an AI algorithm that says, here's this, here's this number that gives you some information on what perhaps you might want to do for those patients. So a lot of our thrust then is how do we get the data so we can then model it, so we can then make those tests that we could integrate into care for the patients. Standardization, you're going to see this thread all throughout the talk, really becomes key toward being able to make this real. When we started down this pathway now about eight years ago, um, we knew we had to start with having good data coming in. And the popular paradigm is data mining which is entirely wrong um, for what we need to do. We recognize we really need to look at this as data farming. So if you think about how food production became industrialized, standardization became a part of it, right? So these, these machines that can um, harvest and cultivate really depended on some standardization. Plant in straight rows with certain spacing for how all of that's going to work. It goes into processing, and how does that machinery work for processing it? So in the long run, down the road, you've got consistent loaves of bread coming out, but it depends on that whole, inf that whole pathway being set up correctly. So we recognize if we want to use this information for our patients in radiation oncology, we need to look at not just the analytics, but the whole pathway for how that information comes in. Um, and so we've progressively built standards um, and that we enable our automation. So I'm going to show you how some of that has worked for us. Our fundamental infrastructure that's the core of this is the uh, MROR, the Michigan Radiation Oncology Analytics Resource. Multi as I said, every patient treated is connected to a database. In fact, they're connected to multiple databases. And so the different pieces of information that we need to understand about the outcomes for the patient and the prognosis come from different places. This is one of the fundamental problems with dealing with EHR data. Um, is how it's distributed and it's inconsistent. So we have spent a lot of effort in constructing a system that automates 
aggregation, integration, and harmonization of that data so that we can then use it. And does it on a um, continual basis because what we do changes continually as we're trying to improve care. So it can't be just a grab the data and go. We have to make a system that lets that happen as part of routine care. Right now, MROAR, we have data with millions of longitudinal records for over 50,000 patients. Um, it's multi-omic, very comprehensive data. So not just the radiation therapy, but the chemotherapy, labs, medications, notes, encounters, all of those different pieces that can be factoring in to what's happening. So you, you know, for each patient, even though there may be guidelines that we're following for that treatment, they're different. Their genome is different. Their social determinants of health um, scenarios are different. Um, and so every patient's treatment is, in effect, an experiment. And we need to be able to pull in all of those together if we want to understand what together matters. A lot of the way that um, clinical trials um, and other tests evolve is along inspiration. So you're, you're driving down the road, you're thinking, oh, I see this pattern emerging. I wonder what that means. How do I design a test around that? What we really want to do is, is flip that paradigm. So what we're trying to get to, and succeeding in getting to now, is standardizing the way that we pull the data and analyze the data, display the data, so that we can then look at it and say, hmm, data from all our patients is showing us this pattern. I wonder why. What does that tell us? What, are we gonna, what could we do with it in the clinic? It still goes back to the inspiration part. You know, what, am I, what does that tell me that I didn't know about before? So, but what it's doing is expanding that discovery paradigm. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how this has played out for us as we first built the system and are then harnessing it to algorithms and approach that you combine statistics and AI to be able to analyze the data. So our first example here was for head and neck patients, or patients treated for head and neck cancers. One of the outcomes you can have, which is very undesirable, is that sometime during the treatment or shortly after the treatment, they have to go to the emergency room. Um, right, we're trying to, we, we want to make sure that we're heading off that unfortunate outcome. What are the factors that would make it, make us understand that which patients are at risk versus the ones that are not or are less at risk? We could then design interventions around that, right? Go back to the shower, here's my inspiration, here's what we could do. But how do we take the data to tell us these are the things that we really need to focus in on? You know, we're all used to approaches where you're grabbing the data and you're modeling and you've, you've got a model and that's your prediction, but clinically that's not enough. It's not enough to have a black box that tells you just look at this number and that's what we're gonna do. We really want understanding. That's where the knowledge is. What does this mean? When we see this interaction, what does it tell us? And so we wanna use this data to be able to drill down on, on the full range of possibilities to then generate some clinical insights. So that understanding is important. That means we have to think about how we're communicating the information. So it's not gonna be sufficient to just have a computer scientist look at some numbers and say this is what matters. We're working with clinicians. They need to have ways that they can understand it and make sense too. So we wanna find ways to marry both pieces. So we started down this pathway, we first took a look at all of our patients um, across all treatment ranges, not just head and neck, who went to the emergency room and asked, you know, where do we see most of them coming in? And you can see in this pattern with this early work from 2019 that we're seeing a lot of patients um, with various head and neck diagnoses coming in. When you go to the emergency room data in the EHR, one of the things you discover is one of the problems with EHR data. EHR data tends to be sparse and irregular. It suffers from missingness. So we're not, physicians are not scientists. They do not follow check, 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 measure, 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 put it in in a standardized way. When you're trying to build a model, you need those pieces. And so one of the struggles with EHR data is that you, you may find that for some patients you have it or you don't. 
you might find the timing of when it comes in is different. You might find the coding that gets used that you think is going to tell you why they go into the emergency room is going to give me everything you want, but they're a little inconsistent, so that doesn't always work. So it took quite a lot to just be able to drill down and find out which things were making it likely to predict which patients went in or what, what was driving them there. But we pulled that in, in too, and that becomes part of what we're doing in our approaches is trying to clean up that EHR data. We recognized that we needed to have multi-omic comprehensive data. So it's not enough just to know how much dose we delivered. You know, that, that may be a part of it. Um, laboratory values might be predictive. So we wanted to take a look at those pieces. Um, when I showed you up here the reasons that they came in, one of the things that emerged was, um, was constipation which you know, in and of itself may not make a lot of sense to you, but constipation is one of the complications of opioid use. And so that was a clue that if we're gonna look at a lot of things, maybe we ought to ask about that. So we've put a lot of effort into, for our medications, taking a look at opioids. Chemotherapy, um, the toxicities that they had, we added um, distance information. So how far are they from the hospital? Does this play a role? In this sample, we have um, 1,300 patients, roughly. Um, it's not really frequent. Um, about 12% um, had um, an emergency room visit during that treatment time. This underscores another part of the, the nature of EHR data. Um, physicians have been at this for a long time. They're pretty good. So what we're looking at, you know, if you think about um, radio signals and you're looking, you got a big blip, but you've got some, a lot of noise and static. And the big things, um, the big signals that are gonna cause it, the big blips, people figured that out long before AI. Here, let's, let's avoid these certain things. Um, when we're looking at toxicity, let's avoid these certain dose levels. That takes care of the big blips. A lot of what we're doing in healthcare now are for events that don't happen all that often. So they're going to be inherently under-sampled data sets. So you may be looking at events that are 12 percent is pretty big. A lot of them are going to be 5 percent. So you're looking for little bits of signal in that noise, which is just fundamentally different from some of the problems that you may encounter. For us, and again, in this case with the emergency room visit, not all that often, about 13 percent, which is already very good compared to many institutions. As I said, we wanted to make sure, as we're, we're taking this approach and figuring out how to standardize it, that we're building in how do we interact with the physicians, with the clinicians. Very um, easy way to help with understanding that data is histogramming so that you can understand those with and without the toxicity. Now, the brain is marvelous at being able to very quickly process a lot of information visually and draw the correct conclusion. In this case, we're seeing as we're looking at distance from the hospital, um, that we're already seeing in the data there's some signal there that the patients who are closer are the ones more likely to come. We'll follow that a little bit further. So we, but we do this for all of the features that we're looking at. So that whole set, all of those features, we do the same thing for all of them to be able to understand the strength of evidence for them, including these visualizations. We then want to understand for each feature individually, before we put it into a model, what's the strength of statistical evidence for that feature? It's also important to understand the confidence intervals. So too often um, in our field, we will find you'll get an AUC and it's just that number and there's no confidence interval for it. They don't give you sensitivity or specificity or any other metrics that are going to tell you about the bigger picture of what's happening. If you want to have confidence and know your ability to move on to other um, settings, it's really important to understand what those confidence intervals are. So we learn to just standardize using bootstrap resampling of our fundamental data set to start getting some way to characterize those. And so in this case, we showed you the visualization with distance and we could start seeing, yeah, at about 34 miles, there seems to be some transition going on. The other piece that we don't typically see in analysis, but you'll see here, is that first column. 
It's a threshold. So it's very nice to have a hazard ratio and know something matters. But clinically, the physician needs to know, okay, but at what level do I need to worry? You know, if a low level is okay, high level is a problem, where's that crossover? So we build that into our analysis right up front. That's gonna give us a clue if this actually makes sense clinically. And you'll see how in, in one of these slides coming up that the, the threshold not quite making sense ended up being a clue to another mechanism going on. So those thresholds have really valuable information. It's important to build them in. We also have to make sure we're careful about covariance among all these variables. Many things are related, and so we want to make sure we're not adding in a big feature space that's basically giving us the same information over and over again. So that's factored into our analysis. When you execute um, XGBoost or any number of other um, machine learning algorithms, they will give you um, an importance metric. Um, every time you run it, you're gonna get a different distribution of those, of course, so a lot of times, again, we find in the literature, at least in our literature, people don't recognize that as a stochastic process and run it multiple times in order to understand what the statistics of that are. But we learned in this particular case that we could combine the statistical information. So here on the y-axis, we're looking at the odds ratio for the feature. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at the mean importance score and then we can look for the combined evidence of that telling us which feature is emerging among that crowd as the thing that gives us the most information. In this case, it's telling us about the constrictor muscle. So when you swallow, um, and you're looking at dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, so that particular muscle group matters. So the, this, this analysis technique is working out to guide us among all of these to the ones that matter most. When we then go and say we have our feature space, um, we've started with 171. Um, we've used the statistical approaches to characterize them, eliminate the ones that are covariate, find the ones with the strongest statistical evidence, make a smaller data set, um, run that through and, and, and make it a parsimonious model and reduce it even further. And we looked at several models for being able to do that. So XGBoost, Random Forest, um, and you can see at not unexpected or not ex unexpectedly, XGBoost gives us the best answer. Uh, when we prune it down to a much smaller set, so now we go from 171 down to 11, um, then we have a, a good model with an AUC of about 0.81, but now we understand by pulling out always the sensitivity and specificity that that AUC is mostly telling me, in this case, about the ability to predict the ones that have it, whereas specificity would tell me about the ones that didn't. Again, in healthcare, a lot of the times, the, you know, we've solved the big problems. So you're gonna be dealing with AUCs on the order of 0.7, um, you're, and then, what is that balance? And clinically, you want to know, is that model telling me they're likely to get it or likely not to get it? AUC won't tell me that, so I need to show both of these things when I show this model. So this then narrowed it down to a few findings. So complexity of opioid prescriptions emerged as relevant. This was a novel finding. So it wasn't particularly which one you used, but the fact that there was more than one, more than three, in this case where our threshold was, that was mattering. And we then went back to our clinicians and said, what does that mean? So that, you know, it could be a sign of difficulty managing the pain, but it could also me be a sign of having multiple providers. So Dr. X likes this opioid, Dr. Y likes that opioid. They see multiple providers. That could be a symptom of that as well. So this gave us some guidance um, that this was important. So among all the things that we could look at, it narrows down to a few where we can generate some understanding. Uh, we have metrics related to the volume of the target that emerges important, but also giving us the threshold. So some of this, again, you might conclude, yeah, the volume probably matters, but where's the crossover? 
what's the threshold at which as a clinician we can say what we should do. Same thing with that muscle group for the superior constrictors. Um, turned out emergency room visits before you started were protective that you wouldn't have one later. So that's where our specificity is high. That could mean you're just monitoring the patient better. Um, so this gives us some more clues about what those features mean. Labs mattered, particularly those associated with hydration and distance from the hospital. Again, it doesn't tell us the why. You know, maybe at 34 miles, they're going to another institution. They're not in our system, so we don't know. It could mean they've decided that's too far to go. I'm just not going to go. So this is not enough to understand what to do. You still need a trial to figure it out. But this shows how you use the data to generate the hypothesis. You start with the big analysis. It tells you here's where the signal is. And then you can be more intelligent in your design of the clinical trial. I'll give you another example here where we have looked at several uh, factors for our patients, um, again, for head and neck. So it's not just emergency rooms. But suppose they don't survive beyond three years. Or they have toxicities associated with the swallowing, dysphagia, or production of um, saliva that if impacts your your dental health, your ability to swallow, all of that's important, so that's xerostomia. So we're looking at those changes, and we could see when we looked back that some of those things changed over time. So the survival rate, and we got better, but what was going on earlier? So if I look at those, those blue Xs in 2017, there were fewer people um, surviving past three years than there were now. So what could be the factor there? We again, looked at a large set of multi-omic data, labs, chemotherapy, medications, disease site characteristics, and we're using our automated approaches to winnow that data. So we combine the statistical profiling, where we're reporting and using the bootstrap resampling. Uh, we use, for every one of those features, um, a plot of the distribution and also a logistic fit that tells us um, visually, what's the strength of signal here? And again, a lot of times, those with the toxicity, so that's, in this case, that's the yellow, it's going to be a small number. Right? So we're not going to find, you know, you'd like to say, has it, doesn't have it. What we're really finding clinically is, has more risk, has less risk. Sometimes there's not a big difference there, but that's what we're acting on clinically. So we want to find a way to make that obvious for the physician colleagues when we're saying, does this feature make sense to you? The histograms with these plots have worked out very well. We also want to see how's our practice changing over time. And so these box whisker plots by year that just become part of our standardized reporting give us a very quick way of analyzing each of those features to understand does that associate with the time changes I'm seeing. There's a lot on here. I won't ask you to see all of it. But this is a standardized uh, reporting format that we're using and have introduced to be able to distill this data. What you can, and, we, and as we've done this, we've decided to pull out front and center the missingness of data. So those features that you know, we have an incomplete data set for, that's our first column. We also want to know in the parentheses here, uh, so you're, you're most likely to relative in the last um, number in parentheses is, what fraction actually had something bigger? So that all becomes part of it. So we analyze all of those pieces um, for those patients. And then on the bottom frame, we're running a multivariable XGBoost model to find out, did the model do better than just looking at the features by themselves? Because it's not always the case that they do. In this case, we're finding very high doses to the submandibular gland mattered. And we realized that was a surrogate for muscle, muscle, muscular structures that we hadn't contoured. So this gave us a clinical insight we did not have before for how to approach with those patients. When we looked at survival, we ended up discovering that in those early years, the patient population just came in with bigger diseases. The target volumes were bigger. And that gave us the answer to what was changing with our patients over time. It also generated a new insight for us. 
which was that the platelet lymphocyte ratios and neutrophil lymphocyte ratios um, were mattering for predicting that survival rate. That's something we could find in the literature, but had been underappreciated in our experience. It's always important to then go back and find out if your new tool is giving you something that makes sense with the literature. What I'm showing you here is when we found out these new insights actually correlated with literature we weren't familiar with, um, but underscored the validity of our finding. Similarly with the PLR ratios. So I think this gets, you know, this for me highlights the importance of working with standardizations in the literature and the metadata to make it possible to fold that finding back into what you're getting from your models locally. Um, we are carrying this out, uh, these standardization efforts out at a global level as well. So we're, we're getting our own data, but we also work um, in developing standardized ontologies with multiple stakeholders from multiple institutions and multiple professional societies for how the data should be laid out, what our value sets should be, so that we can have in the long run interoperable AI ready data sets. So in summary, reliable models are built from good data. It's really important to be an attentive data farmer for that whole information pipeline. And we're finding with that combination of standardization, infrastructure, visualizations and reporting that tie back to clinicians that we can start automating this discovery process so that when we get to testing and designing trials, we're much better oriented. Thank you. Yes, I just have a quick question. Uh, a lot of your confidence intervals look pretty, pretty large, and I, I presume that's because you're using local population of patients here in Michigan. Ha what are the, uh, the hurdles to expanding to other population cohorts at other medical centers? Um, of course, you know, there's, uh, this, is, this is one of the, yeah. the million dollar questions, right? Yes. In order to improve the statistics. And, and really talking now, you know, about, about workflows in particular, the whole idea of a collaborative workflow that is, uh, that, that admits um, open but um, uh, secured access uh, to, um, uh, to data of this type that can improve the confidence on your, yeah. on your findings. Yeah, thanks, great, great question. So, you know, just to clarify, some of those confidence intervals are fairly narrow. So the threshold is actually working pretty well or the values are pretty stable. For others, they're much broader. And so that's important to understand the distinction. You know, am I gonna pin my hopes on this one feature? If it's emerging with a broad confidence interval, probably not. And so there's two examples here. To get to the multi-institutional data, we recognize we're gonna to need to do this in a federated way. That group that I showed you toward the end that's developed this standardized ontology, we are working with now to build federated data systems based on this standardized ontology for being able to produce the results of it. So we're not looking at this point of putting the raw data out there. You know, that raises a lot of concern. But if we're looking at the type of analysis that we just did, so which patients go to the emergency room, which patients have these toxicities, with this standardized infrastructure, then we have the ability to send around that query to everyone and find, are we all seeing the same thing? So it's a, it's a practical middle step to trying to get to these larger data sets, um, while very real concerns about privacy and ethics are worked out. Absolutely. Through your um, correct. Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. That we can do. Um, I have a question about maybe your um, take on how far along are your things for applying GPT. I'm assuming it's a, a burning question in many of our minds. In terms of, it, are those systems ready for the healthcare systems? Like, what do you feel from your perspective? Um, 
so it's fascinating. It's already being built into health systems. So the the uh, elect you know the healthcare records companies are trying to figure out how to build it in. Right now, they're largely trying to build it in around making standardized language. So they express you know the notes that they express, not so much for discovery of what matters, but at least how the data is represented. But you can see this is going to come very fast. It's not going to be driven by science. It's going to be driven by marketing and by you know, the promise of reducing effort. Um, you know, one of the, as we've seen in the results with, with chat GPT, you know, is it artificial intelligence or is it artificial um, not really bright <laughs> in, in terms of what comes out? It looks convincing, right? That's the scary thing about it. The language convinces you it knows what it's talking about. But then when you dig into the data, you start to realize maybe not. Um, I think that will come, but I don't think it's ready yet. So not at this point, not Chat GPT. Um, something in turn, right? So like our models that we have here, you know, we're looking at how now do we how do we take that and then turn it into a metric like a lab value that shows up in the chart, and that doesn't dictate a yes or no, but it says this is a number you should pay attention to. So that's where we're at right now with these, as we you know we've made the models and we have a way of pulling that in. I think the promise of Chat GPT is that will come, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Um, kind of related to the first question and considering like data farming and good data, what is your thought processes on making decisions about outliers in a field like oncology, especially with like smaller data sets and like something as individual as like medicine and things like that, like how do you determine what to do with outliers and... Oh, what to do with outliers? Yeah, and like drawing information from them and things like that. Yeah, I, th I think it, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't get nearly enough attention. Um, and I find very often, people love to look at the mean, you know, they'll, they'll give you a fit, there's the line, they won't show you the error bars. Um, and there's a lot of information in understanding those outliers, you know, why? What happened there? What does that mean? Um, that's why we have explicitly you know, built in these confidence intervals so that we can start to understand if they're spread out or normal. But we do also look at the outliers um, offline when we're doing it and say, you know, what, what does this use case tell us that's not part of our thinking already? And I think you're right, we need to, you know, as we're evolving these methods to automate this reporting, we need ways to be able to distinguish outliers that are there because it's some error, you know, it's a curation problem versus outliers because it's actually a signal that you should be paying attention to. And it's challenging because these are events that are not, that are rare. So statistically, right, they look very similar to one another in terms of the numerical signature, but I think that's an important point. Your second question. Um, I thought that was like, in collaboration with other institutes, how do you define the making decisions about the outliers? Like, how do you make decisions about the outliers? So yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a wide variation. We, we happen to, you know, with the system that we built up front, we're, we're a little further along on, on some of these pieces, but they're, all of the collaborators that we have as we've developed this ontology that are also building these systems, we're all working in the same direction. That's why we stay together on this piece to, to make it, to be able to standardize. You know, it's not enough that it's just our institution and how we do it. It really needs to be something that propagates out to the world, and so we do both locally and globally as we do. 